Open up your Bibles to Exodus 20. Exodus 20, uh, verses 17 to 21 is where we are at today. Uh, we've been going through the Ten Commandments, and we'll be finishing up the series uh, today. And as we go through, the, as I've gone through the series, for me, it's been very eye-opening. Because uh, if you're anything like me, as, as I mentioned in the past, the Ten Commandments, the rules that God gives to us, often it's a burden. Often it's things that we don't want to do, but because it's the right thing to do, we choose to do it. But what I've been trying to share with you over and over and over, for the Israelites, they were brought out of slavery. They were brought out of burdensome living, brought into a life of freedom, brought into a place where it's, it's, in, it's through these commands, actually, that we know what it actually means to love God. It's through these commands we actually know what it means to love one another. So things that I've mentioned in the past is, for example, like lying, like last week. We talked about how, uh, in, how in the Ten Commandments it forbids us, it commands us not to lie. So in our minds we think we shouldn't you know, tell these lies. In our, in our lives we shouldn't lie about whether we're sick or not or whether if we're running late to, say them, to tell them, oh, we're on our way when we're still at home. Right? I've addressed some of these issues, but really the core of it all is once we start to believe that lie, once a, a, a nation believes a lie, for example, like the Holocaust, once a one uh, ethnic group, nationality, believes uh, their eth ethnicity is greater than the other, what starts to happen is it's, it, it's okay to take the life of another. It's once, once that little lie is believed by, nation, by a whole nation, that's when we see genocide happen, like in Cambodia. A lying leads to corruption, lying leads to death, uh, I shared even last week, once a society is built on trust, once people believe in their society they can trust, uh, the economy boosts even more so, more, more so than the skill set. When that economy truly believes in each other, the economy grows. So you start, you start to see that these, these, these Ten Commandments, it's much more than simply morality. It's morality that, that what God is saying is right or wrong, but once we, we, we live off of that, we, we set ourselves up for flourishing. Other things I've mentioned is uh, something like adultery. Adultery is, is this idea that it's, it's wrong because you're gonna, you're gonna hurt your wife or you're gonna hurt your, or your husband. But the core of that is, is if that family unit breaks up, then the children are left for a broken family. And if you have a society of broken families, what happens is a broken society. It's in this mindset we wanna read uh, Exodus 20, verse 17. Because it's in this, we want to see that as we obey, there is a promise. There is hope, a hope for something greater. So in verse 2, we start off by saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then in Exodus 17, 2017, it says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. And this is the last command that God gives to us. Right before this was the command not to lie. Before that, not to murder, or not to steal. So it ends, the, it, the, the, the trajectory of the Ten Commandments, it seems like it's getting uh, more and more strict, and then it comes to this idea of do not covet. We may be thinking, what's the big deal about coveting? What's the, what's the big deal about wanting the thing of somebody else? And that's what we want to look into today. What, is, what does it mean to covet? Covet, what it means is it's, it's craving, it's desiring something of someone else's. It's not simply desiring. It's not simply saying, oh, that guy has a nice car. That's nice. I want that car. It's, it's over-desiring. It's craving. It's, I want that nice car and you start to scheme about how you can get that car, and you want it so badly, you'll start to cut corners to get that car, whether it means that you'll actually steal it, or you'll start to make money in such a way that it's, 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 not, uh, it's not authentic. And once you start to do that, you will start to build your own life upon a foundation that will completely crumble. And so with this, the first point is, covenant hollows out your soul. That when you covet something, it hollows out, it empties out your soul. And what I mean by that, it's a simple idea that when you see a tree with, with a, a sturdy trunk, 
when you see a tree that's, that, that reaches on high and reaches wide, it seems like a strong tree. But if bacteria starts to form, if it, start, if it starts to hollow out from the inside, it's simply a matter of one gush of wind that will, that will, uh, that will push over the tree and it will fall. It's a simple idea that once you start to hollow out your own soul, you may achieve what you want, but there's nothing of substance in your heart. And that's what coveting will do for you. And I want to point this out uh, throughout today. You'll have a life that will seem like it's successful. It'll seem like it's filled with love and happiness. But once you fill your heart with coveting, it's a life that seems strong, but it's completely weak and completely empty. It's like creating a cavity in your own heart. It's empty. It looks strong, but once you bite into it, it breaks. And so with it, there's two warnings uh, that, that this scripture will, will help us see. It's a warning that coveting will destroy you from the inside out. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a warning that once you covet, it'll destroy you, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. Murder you see visibly how it can destroy someone from the outside in, right? Once you see someone aggressively hitting somebody else, you see that that's wrong. So you see it. When you see someone steal, once you see that, you see that that's wrong. Murder kills life. Theft kills economy. Adultery kills a marriage. Lies kill relationships. Coveting kills a soul. And no one else may ever know that but you. Once you crave it, it kills. It may kill nobody else, but it will kill you slowly. So it's a warning that God gives to us. Coveting is, he tells us in this command, it's a warning. Don't do this. It will kill your own soul. But with that, it's also an invitation, is it not? Once God tells you, don't do this, it's also an invitation for God who sees what you don't see. It's an invitation for him to say, what you're doing is wrong. And I want you to be able to see that because it will lead you to death. It will lead you to misery. So Romans 7 helps us understand this. Romans 7, uh, 7 to 8, it says this, and this is Paul talking about how it's the law that helps us see our sin. Uh, what then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if we had not been for the law, for if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. If it, if it wasn't for the law, I would not have known sin, for I, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, because it resides in our hearts, seizing our, an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. What Paul is saying is, because the law told me don't covet, now I start to see in my heart it's raging with these desires. It's like this. Is there a car that somebody has that you want? By me asking that question, now I've helped you see. Yes, there is. My neighbor's car. It's a nice I-30 or whatever it is. Um, career. Is there someone's career that you crave? You start to see his work schedule, and he doesn't have to work till 9 p.m. He gets his hog one gets off at 6 p.m. So you crave, right? That international school gives you a legitimate visa, right? So you <laughs> crave. Uh, spouse, you see someone's spouse, and you think, I want that spouse. I want a spouse like that. Why can't my wife, why can't my husband be more like that? Is there a talent that somebody has? You see him playing guitar. You see him hooping outside. And you're like, I want that skill. <laughs> Is there a look that somebody has? Yeah, I want to look like that. I want to be that thin. I want to be that fit. Is there a family situation that you crave? All these situations, all these questions, what it does is I simply help you see what's in your heart. The law helps us see what's in our hearts. This command is an invitation by God to say, I want you to see what's in your heart because you don't know what's in your heart. So when I say it, don't covet, you start to see all the illegitimate, Ill illegitimate ways that you covet and you start to realize this is wrong. So we can do everything right on the outside, 
but, but completely be rotting and empty on the inside. And if you're honest with yourself, that's what you want to fix. If you're honest with yourself, you don't want to simply look successful. You actually want to be successful, right? You don't want to just simply look like you have everything right. You actually want to have things done right. Martin Luther, uh, a Christian who changed Christianity, says this about this, uh, this command. This last commandment is addressed precisely to the most upright. This commandment is addressed to those who do everything well, who are disciplined. This command helps us to see for that person that they're not truly honest or virtuous. That's what it's getting at. That's what this command is getting at. The other commands, do not murder. You can say, I haven't murdered anyone. Do not steal. I haven't stolen anything. Do not lie. Eh, maybe. But with this one, you cannot deny what's in your heart. And that's what God is inviting us to be able to see. He's helping us. Well, he's wanting us for us to address what's in our hearts. Because when you covet, it hollows out your soul. And once you start to fill your heart with that desire, you will be filled with emptiness. You will always feel like, I want that. And once you get that, you won't be happy, which leads us to the, sec to the second point. Coveting hollows out your happiness. It doesn't simply hollow out your soul. It hollows out your joy. It hollows out your emptiness. Jesus addresses this in Luke 12, 15. He says, in Luke 12, 15, he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. So he's saying, it's a warning again, like before. It's a warning. Don't do this. It's going to lead to death. It's a warning. Take care. Be on guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. What's Jesus saying? He's saying... Don't build your life on possessions. Don't build your life on abundant possessions because that's not what life is about. What's he addressing? Life is not about possessions. Life is about something else. So for us, when we try to build our life on possessions, we want this house, we want this salary, we want this bank account. It's when we fill our hearts with those dreams, you may get that job, you may get the car, you may get that girl, but you will always find out it's, happiness for a moment. It's empty happiness. It's hollow happiness. This past week, I was talking with uh, some church members, and we're talking about how life is short. In light of everything that's happened, we're just talking about that that's the reality. Life is short. And one church member said this that I think is very wise. He says, yes, life is short, but then he says this. It's one, it's, it's, life is short, and you have to realize life is short, but from there, he says this, so how long will it take you to figure out what's worth living for, right? If you know life is short, it's one thing to realize that, but then how long will it actually take you for you to realize what is important? Because covetousness, it's lies. It's lies built on lies, and we start to live our life after those lies. And we try to build our life upon those lies. And the question then this, the, that this passage that has for you is how long will it be for you to realize, yes, life is short. So because life is short, what are you going to live for? What will you build your life upon? Rockefeller, one of the richest men to ever live this earth, was asked a question, how much money will it take you for you to be happy? And he said, just a little bit more. And that's the reality. Just a little bit more. Just to get married. Then to have kids. To get that job and then get that uh, promotion. And then get that salary. After that salary, then I want this. And it continues on and on and on. And the question is, is how long will it take for you to realize it's a lot? It will lead to empty happiness. It hollows out your, ha your happiness. You're happy for a moment but it leads to an empty sense of joy. Coveting this command, the for, the, of it being forbidden for you, what it does is coveting does not allow you to actually be happy. That's what it does. It doesn't allow you to be happy. It doesn't allow you to actually have substantial joy. 
So we can think, oh, then all these things are bad, right? The job is bad. The family is bad. No, those are actually good things. Those are actually ways in which God blesses us. The problem is not the possessions, right? The problem is the person. The problem is the person, not the possession, right? For you English teachers, the problem is not the object. It's the subject. It's you. You can live, you can have, you can have grown up in America, and have coveted a white picket fence and a big home with a nice lawn. You come to Korea, your coveting starts to change, right? You want to look different, have maybe more white skin, or you want to look a certain way because you are in a world where it tells you different lies, and because of those different lies, your coveting changes. The issue is not the object, the issue is the subject. It's not the possession, it's the person, right? Uh, James 4.2 addresses this. You desire, you do not have, so you murder. The problem is you, it's your desire. You covet, you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. Because the problem is not the other person, it's you. You're coveting, you're envious, you want what that person has. Uh, all parents in here can agree that we see this with our children all the time. I have twin boys, um, and these twin boys are, uh, teaches me about coveting every day. Uh, just this past week, uh, I was with the both of them, and so Jonah has uh, this, this uh, toy, I think airplane that he was playing with. So he's like playing with it, he's all happy. Jonah's all happy, he's like, look at my little toy. And then Judah comes into the scene with a bottle of lotion. <laughs> not, not playing with a toy. He's like, he's like, look at my lotion. He's like, I love my lotion. And, and Jonah's like, ooh, I like my airplane. Ooh, a bottle of lotion. <laughs> so he drops the airplane to play with a bottle of lotion. That's coveting, right? <laughs> what does the bottle of lotion offer you? Yes, nice skin. But do they care for that? Not really. But simply because Judah has it, Jonah wants it. That's coveting. You could covet anything. You could covet anything. As long as you, when you eat it and you make it look delicious, that person's going to covet that. I want that food. My food looks good, but oh, that guy's food, he looks really good. But I want you to see how deep-seated this is, for us parents especially. Because for us parents, what we'll do is this. So when, when Jonah wants Judah's lotion, what we will say is, no, 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 don't have that lotion. Let me give you something else. Or maybe we'll give him a different bottle of lotion. What are we teaching the kids? Oh, you want to covet this? Okay, let me give it to you. Or what we can say is, Judah, you should share, which is a good principle. But then if we don't actually have the deeper lesson of, Jonah, the actual issue is this. Jonah, what you should desire is not that lotion. You should desire Judah's happiness. Right? And as, as parents, that's what we want to foster in our children. Right? Not just to, oh, you want that car? Okay, let me get you a car. You want this? Okay, let me get you that. But as parents, what we should teach them is not to desire these things in one sense, which isn't bad. But the real issue ends up being then, can they love their neighbor? Can they rejoice in, can, can you rejoice in Judah's lotion, essentially? Which leads us to the, to the third point. Coveting hollows out your love. Coveting hollows out your love. And I want you to see how deep-seated this is, because often all we try to do is, is stop coveting. Oh, it's bad to do this. We just try to kill that desire. But scripture has us go the whole other way. And to not just say, don't covet, love your neighbor, be happy for him, be happy for her. Uh, Romans 13, verse 9. For the commandments you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So it really helps you realize the issue is love. The issue is not necessarily that you want that car. The issue is you can't be happy for that person when they get that car, when they get that promotion, 
When your friend gets engaged, there's jealousy and not true happiness. Coveting hollows out your love. And so we fake it. You say, oh, good job, congratulations. But in your heart, there's envy. In your heart, there's jealousy. So we simply try to tell ourselves, stop envying. This is wrong. But we don't go all the way to help us see what we should desire is how happy we should be when that person is getting married, when that person does have a child, when the person does get that promotion. We should be people that are genuinely excited, right, for their happiness. But because we can't do that, we have plastic love. It's hollowed out love. Oh, good job. I'm so happy for you. But in your heart, you can't be happy. So how do we stop coveting? That's the real issue, right? How do we stop coveting? It's one thing for me to say, stop coveting. But then how do you actually start loving? Contentment. Contentment fills your soul with happiness and love. When you're truly content, it fills your soul with happiness and love. It's only when you're truly content and you realize that it's in that place you have the ability and the power to love others. So how do we do this? How do we actually be content? How do we actually stop coveting and how can we be content? There are three options here, only one works. There's three options in which how a majority of us probably deal with our issue of coveting. Uh, the first option is disciplining our hearts. We try to simply put mind over matter, put truth over, op for, for, over desire. And so we, we, what we try to do, and this is how I think many Westerners do it, or maybe even if you're from the Middle East, this is how you may do it. It's this idea that you want to discipline your desires, your actual heart, so that you don't crave. So you try to, you try to force your heart to desire something. You try to, you try to, you try to force your heart to want something else. But you will always fail at it because the heart, by definition, is desire. The heart, by definition, is to love. The heart, by, by, by definition, is to live for something. That's the heart. You can't stop the heart from, let it, let it, from, from being the heart. It always desires. Michael Horton, he's a, he's a, a scholar, a, a Bible scholar, and he's talking to a rabbi about this passage. And the rabbi says to, to Michael Horton, he says, you see the difference between my religion and your religion is my religion is all about what you should or shouldn't do, but your religion starts to address the heart. He's saying that's impossible. He's saying you can't do that. And he says this, the biggest, the big, biggest reason we don't talk about the heart is because if this commandment is true, you're sinning all the time. You're always sinning. And then Michael Horton says, exactly. The issue is the heart. You can't stop your heart from desire. You can't discipline your heart to desire the right things. So the other way to do it, if you're Asian, this may resonate with you, to kill your desire. Because that's what Buddha will teach, to kill your desire. The reason you suffer is because this is what you want, and this is, this is your desire, and this is the gap. And this gap is the suffering. And so you're taught to kill the desire, to stop wanting it, to suppress it, and to kill that desire. <clears throat> but you realize you can't do that. Because to kill, to, to kill the desire is to kill the heart. And to kill the heart is to kill the self. We're not... A we're not a brain on a stick, we're a heart on a stick. No matter how smart we are, no matter how logical we are, we're driven by something. You cannot kill your desire. And then even if this was true, even if you could kill your desire, what you would have is, yes, a peaceful world, but you will not have a loving world if you kill desire, if you kill the heart. So option one, discipline your heart. Option two, kill your desire. Both fail. So what's the third option? And this is the good news. The good news is this. What Jesus tells us is not to uh, discipline your heart, per se, or to kill your desire. He says, you need a new heart. The issue is the heart. 
And you can't change the heart by adding rules. You actually need a new heart. And that's the gospel. That's what Jesus came here for. Ezekiel 36, when it talks about what God will do in the future, when Jesus will come, this is what Jesus will do. In Ezekiel 36, verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean, a pure heart. You will be clean from uncleanness, from all your uncleanliness. Idols, I will cleanse you. And then what does he say? I will give you a new heart. Because that's what you need. I will give you a new heart and, I, and, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove that heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And that's the hope for the Christian. When we can't love, but we go to, we go to God and say, God, I can't love. I can't put on love. I can't conjure up love. God, give me a new heart. And that's what Jesus does on the cross. That sprinkling of clean water that's told in Ezekiel that happens on the cross. Because it's on the cross, you give God your heart. He crucifies that heart and he gives you his heart. And that's the heart he gives you. He gives you Christ's heart. He gives you God's heart. A heart that is cleansed, a heart that is pure, a heart that is able to love, and a heart that's able to trust. Because that's where contentment comes from. Contentment comes from that new heart with new desires. Philippians 4, Paul talks about this. Paul, a man who suffered and suffered well, says this. He says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. What he's saying is, I found the secret to contentment. This is it. It's right here. This is a secret to how you can be content. I know how to be brought low to suffer, to be persecuted, to be physically beat up, to go for days with, with, without food. He says, I, I know how to be brought low. I know, how to be, I know how to abound. I've lived successfully. I've done well. And he says, whether I'm brought low or, or, I, or I live in a, a life of abundance, he then says this, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and and need. And he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know that that's, that's one of the most quoted verses of the Bible. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And the context that you may uh, use that verse is, uh, is a hard challenge, right? Like you have to do something at, at work or you have to do something with family. It's hard. So you, you, have this, you have this verse memorized. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. But where this verse comes from is with a challenge of contentment, right? What Paul is saying here is contentment is so hard. Contentment is impossible. And it's that obstacle, that goal that we're trying to attain that he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then in verse 19, he tells us how do we actually do it. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. My God, God will supply. He will give you what you need according to his riches. He's got everything that you ever wanted and needed. According to his riches, he'll give, he'll give you everything according to the, his riches according to, uh, in his glory. What covetousness is this? Covetousness is I want what I want. That's, that's coveting. Contentment is this. I want what God wants for me. I want what God wants for me. Isn't that what Paul is saying? God will supply every need. So if I have this need, God will meet it. If I don't have that need, God won't provide it. God will provide. He will supply every need of yours according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I want what God wants for me. I hope that's what you want, that you won't live a life going after your greed, coveting and coveting and coveting, emptying out your soul, emptying out your, your joy, emptying out your love, but you will live a life where what, well, you, well, you live in such a way that you want what God wants. Brandon alluded to this uh, in the beginning, and I want to share it again. Um, last night we had a memorial um, for
for Michael. And Sabrina mentioned something that um, I had forgotten uh, that Michael shared. Um, so Michael passed away uh, this past Monday. And with that, uh, for me, I've been thinking about all the things that he shared in our community group. And even yesterday, I was just amazed at how beautiful of a singer he was. Um, like we at our church only really heard a glimpse. He was an amazing singer. But one thing that I think I'll never forget as how in the past, you know, nine months, how content he was. Sabrina share, shared this, and this is what Michael said. He said, cancer is the best thing that happened to me. It taught me to be a better husband and a better father and a better friend. You don't discipline your heart to desire that. Like, I don't, it doesn't, it, I don't care how noble you are. I don't care how good you are. You can't say that. That can't be true. You don't kill your desire. What happened in Michael? God gave him a new heart. He gave him a heart that can trust in the midst of pain. In the midst of the worst thing that could have happened to him, he can sense that God is still in control. And because God is in, in control and he knows what I need, he was content. I can say that he died well because he lived well. You can't die well if you don't live well. But if you know that God is in control, that he is good, he knows your needs. If you know God is good, whatever happens, you can trust. And it's in that pain, no matter how many questions you have, you can be content. I've seen it. We've seen it. And I think that's a challenge for us today. How long will it take you to realize life is short? But when you realize that, how long will it take you for, for, for you to start to live for the things that matter? The sad truth of it is, is for many of us, we can be moved by this talk, but then tomorrow live for our own desires. But I want to challenge you, especially in light of all that has happened. I do believe God is speaking to this church specifically in light of all that has happened. Don't build your life on possessions. Don't live for that possession, that thing that your neighbor has. But realize life is short. So love well. Know Jesus. Be satisfied in him. For that is what will last. Let's pray.